Well, good morning. The Eagle Info Hour is underway today. And uh, it's going to be a bit of a, I think, a very fascinating uh, hour. Coming up in a little while, we're going to have Steve Peterson talking about how you and I can much more enjoy the beautiful, great outdoors, really just outside our door itself. We'll get to that coming up. I want to welcome to the program this morning, though, first of all, John Hergenrather and Marianne Pike of Creation Hi. Encounter. Good morning, Marianne. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. It's good to ha- be here. <laughs> good. And John, are, we, are you on the line with us, too? Yes. Yes, I am. Well, good morning. And uh, and I, it's going to be a, a fun conversation here. And I want you to think of it that way. We'll, we'll be talking about topics. And Marianne, if you want to jump in and I'm asking John a question or vice versa, you're welcome to. And we'll just uh, right. kind of make it a fun Free for all Friday moment here. <laughs> now, first of all, how is it that you two know one another and are working on this project together? Marianne, you start. Okay. Well, 12 years ago, my family and I went on a, a trip with John to the John Day Fossil Beds. And it was a life-changing experience for our family because we had been in creation science for a long time, getting information and reading books and stuff, but we had never been on a field trip. And so when we went with John, we he showed us evidences for the global flood. We had hands-on experience digging fossils and all of this exciting stuff. So that really got our family hooked. And so ever since then, we've been going on his trips. And uh, so for the last four years, I've been helping him out on the trips. Well, you sound like you found a really great customer here. Uh, John, and, and one that enjoys uh, what it is you, you offer as well as uh, helps helps kind of spread. The, you have an evangelist there, it sounds like to me, too. So, John, <laughs> tell me about your interest uh, in Creation Encounter and how it is you are opening up this um, new view to a, a truth that apparently has uh, not always been welcomed or has been deliberately avoided. Yes, it sure has uh, in academic uh, circles and, and so forth. Uh, uh, even churches kind of avoid the creation issue, uh, and so the kids are the ones who I think suffer from that and uh, not having that that uh, knowledge, and especially the hands-on knowledge. Uh, uh, you know that, that God is indeed uh, our Creator, and He is the one who has, you know made all these things. And so what we have done, I think, but the burning passion of my heart is to get people out there, get their fingernails dirty, see firsthand what is, uh, what we're talking about, and not just out of a book. One little girl I remember said a few years ago, wow, I've been studying this in my book for, for years, and now I get to experience it and feel it. So that sticks with people, and that's what I think we really have seen. Yeah, I think just in my own case, unless I can really put my hands on it and feel it, and uh, in some cases break it if allowed, I, I can't really understand things uh, just mm-hmm. simply from a uh, an academic kind of view. I, I have to experience them in order to really, to really know them in that sense. I want to get you to talk to me a little bit about Evidences of the uh, the Great Flood and why it is uh, you see this as a, a, a key part, and this goes for both of you too, uh, Marianne uh, mm-hmm. and John, uh, why is this yeah. a key part of uh, what you look for and find evidences of, and why is there such a bias maybe to ignore or avoid this evidence? Wow, that's, that's a lot of... A lot of uh, things to talk about right there, but it, the flood is a turning point in terms of our worldview, because uh, if the flood indeed uh, created and, and laid down the rocks and fossils in, in a short period of time, not too long ago, then it changes everything. It's a supernatural uh, event that we are looking at and not a natural uh, thing. And Marianne, do you want to talk about the quartz sites and the things that we show them as evidence for that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sure. We we have some really amazing rocks that we take people to. There's this gravel outcrop, and we have people collect these little rounded rocks, and they're called quartzites. And they've traveled 350 
to 400 miles away from the original source in Montana and Idaho. And so we have the group think about, you know, how were these rocks transported? And this layer is not a small layer. It's like several hundred feet thick, too. And then it, mm-hmm. there, are other, there are other features about it, too, that suggest it was in a water flow. And so that there is, is one of the, the, the main evidences we like to show in the gorge, because how do you, how do you explain rock that's nowhere found here, mm. but it's found in Montana and Idaho, and it's transported in this thick layer, broken up, rounded, and transported. And then even on the, the, the east of the, the Rockies, um, we see them transported 800 miles away. So some huge catastrophe had to have distributed all of these quartzite rocks. Um, we also find uh, colified wood in between the the lava rock layers. These rock layers have been dated by by geologists at fifteen to sixteen million years ago. But this this colified wood is not completely petrified, so it's still organic. How does this, <laughs> does this wood remain organic over 15, oh, 16 million years ago? Yes. Because carbon, carbon, the total carbon decay is supposed to be 100,000 years. If that is the extent of organic material life. Well, lifespan. I think, and, and part of that answer there, I think we understand why there might be a bias uh, for these discoveries, because it would be upsetting yeah. to the carbon dating world of uh, hundreds of millions of years to have this kind of... Uh, Let's call it academic dissonance that's going on, and and, and no no way to really explain it. Now, and talking about yeah. the Great Flood as a cataclysm, um, and we talk the waters of the deep and the opening up. I've heard suggestions and different theories about that there were huge hypersonic jets of water coming up from the ground that later became rain, uh, as as part of the explanation of how cataclysmic how world altering this flood could have been and uh, and ultimately changing uh the mixture of the atmosphere and making it uh, uh less hyperbaric kind of an atmosphere less uh less dense uh, atmosphere in many ways uh is there is there part of that in your research too john to explain how this actually happened <clears throat> well one of the things um that's that points to is the uh, the fountains of the great deep bursting open, like it says there in Genesis. Yes. And uh, one of the things uh, that uh, is obvious is the lava flows. Is what uh, the lava flows we see here in the Northwest are different. They're, they're global. They're they're huge. They okay. Cover- if if you hold that uh, yeah. thought, we're going to continue on the lava flow. Uh, discussion and uh, much more with our guests this morning. They're uh, joining us from Creation Encounter, Marianne Pike and John Hergenrather. Call now. The number is 896 1980 AM 980 The Eagle. Good morning. You ever wonder? I do. I wonder a lot. I mean, I thought, you know, by the time I reached this age in life, I would have less less wonder about me. But actually, I wonder and and find more life fascinating than than ever with each year because I realize increasingly how much I don't know. And that uh, is a uh, is a great learning curve, I think, for a lot of us. And uh, joining us this morning, uh, the website is Creation Encounter. Dot com And we, we're linked, by the way, you can go on our Facebook page, AM 980 The Eagle. We're also uh, tweeting out information about the, the folks we have right now on the show with us. And they are John Hergenrather and Marianne Pike of Creation Encounter. And uh, the idea is for, for folks to actually experience what it is in the, in your view, the truth and creation science, that this is a world that God built, that God made, and it is consistent with the biblical references that we find, and that it may be upsetting to those in the world of science uh, that uh, have disputing viewpoints. But, I, you know, it's interesting to me. If you look at a high, you know, a science book you had in high school or elementary school, you, ha- you pretty much have to laugh out loud at much of it today because we've learned more. 
And uh, you don't really have that problem with the Bible. The Bible said there's a great flood, and uh, we understand that. John, you were talking right before the break about uh, lava flows in the opening of the deep, as is referenced in uh, the book of Genesis. And tell me uh, a little bit more about uh, what you were going to reference there. Well, yes, you were talking about the um, cataclysm that uh, the flood is and and would have been, and uh, part of the evidence of that is the these uh, these the earth bursting open and opening up cracks and lava flowing in in ways that it certainly isn't going to, uh, doing today. We see that right here in the northwest, where it has traveled from right near the state of Idaho <clears throat> all the way to the coast, which is over four hundred miles of of uh, these single layers of, of lava, and now, of course, we see these as the salt layers, which Marianne was talking about. So that was part of the evidence of the flood um, that we looked at. Very interesting. And, you know, sometimes we'll look at uh, large rock formations, uh, mountains or otherwise, and, and we've been all conditioned to think, well, this happened over millions and millions of years, and I've often thought it'd be a fascinating question. What if uh, the cataclysm that you're talking about was such that you literally had a mountain range boom up, you know, maybe not overnight, but in a matter of days or weeks or short months as a possibility to explain some of the inconsistencies that we find today? And Marianne, um, when you when you're talking about looking and discovering these things, there's a sense of wonder I get in your voice as well. Um, what what are some of the lessons that you have learned and and been able to apply uh, really to your faith, ultimately, and to the uh, accuracy of the Bible. Well, as I go out into creation, I think it just affirms, reaffirms in my heart, and encourages me, too, that Christ is creator, that he is intimate, and that he is involved in our lives. I do a talk on monarchs, and we, we talk about their migration and it takes like four or five generations to get to one destination that a, a grandfather, a great-grandfather butterfly previously wintered at. It, there's just miracle after miracle in creation that say that Jesus Christ it had to, a brilliant mind had to have created this. And then when we go on to the geology, we see all of this havoc that happened mm. in the rock layers. <laughs> you see these deep layers of lava, and it's like, whoa, I, I, it, you know, it, something big happened here. You see with the fossils, you know, fragmentary bones everywhere, and trees without roots, and um, leaves without trees, and that are preserved pristinely. So this was a, this was a cataclysm, mm-hmm. and it is verified in the rock layer, and it, ver- it verifies also the, the record in Scripture that says that this flood was was global. It says all the high hills were covered by this water, and nothing that had breath in its nostrils survived. So um, we see that in the rock layers, and we see Christ's intimate handiwork in in creation too, the miraculous there. And so I think it just every time I go out, <laughs> it's so refreshing yeah. and so affirming. That Jesus Christ is in control, and we can trust the Scripture's record, and we can give Him the benefit of the doubt, even though we don't have all the answers. <laughs> I think that that may be the best way to uh, understand uh, trust in Christ is giving uh-huh. Him the benefit of the doubt, even if something momentarily doesn't add up to our limited experience and and uh-huh. ability to understand. Yeah. Another question, and this is for uh, for John and, and Marianne, if you want to chime in too, but when we talk about the Great Flood and and literally wiping off of the face of the earth all of these creatures, all of these living beings, do you have any uh, particular insights as to why the Lord felt it necessary to do that? And, and talk to me about the scriptural references that point you to that. <laughs> you want to you do that, Marianne? Oh well, yeah. See, I think I think with with uh, creation, we see all of this this destruction that happened, and it does testify to the holiness of God. It says that man was wicked in Genesis, that and all of the thoughts of his mind were wicked and and evil. 
And so it, it is a demonstration that God does mm-hmm. not tolerate sin. He will not tolerate sin. But the very fact that we exist <laughs> and that, yes. that God preserved Noah and his family and the animals that were on the ark just demonstrates his grace and his love and his mercy to everyone who trusts in him. It says in, in Genesis, and it also says in um, I think it's Hebrews or Romans, that Noah was a man, a righteous man, right. and that he was a preacher of righteousness. And, you know, we may not think that that we are, are great people, but if we are trusting in Jesus Christ, our Savior, He is our righteousness. He is our goodness as we trust in Him. And so I think, you know, we can, we can find a, a Christ's love also in the global flood. Well, that's a, that, that's a great answer in a short amount of time. And, you know, the <laughs> reference, too, about the corruption of all flesh and needing to eradicate that is really the mark of a loving God that was mm-hmm. willing to take on that uh, severe responsibility. Anyway, yeah. thank you both. Uh, if you'd like to know more about... Uh, Creation Encounter and John Hergen Rather and Marianne Pike. You can go to our Facebook page at AM980 The Eagle. Thank you both very much. Have a great weekend.